Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Aaron Powell, a research fellow here at Cato and editor of Libertarianism.org. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Today we're talking about African Americans, libertarianism, and the state. Joining us is Jonathan Blanks, a research associate in the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. This may seem like a silly and kind of obvious first question, but the state generally hasn't been too kind to black people, <laughs> has it? I mean there's there's the obvious monstrosity of, of slavery, but it it certainly didn't stop there. No, no, no. The, the long there's a long history of uh, blacks in the state not uh, not working very well together. I mean, you you have it started with the Constitution and the implicit recognition with the Three Fifths Compromise, um, and then you have the Supreme Court decisions like Dred Scott, where uh, Judge Taney said, Justice Taney said, uh, there is no rights that a, that the white man should respect of a black man. And during slavery, you had stuff like the Fugitive Slave Act, which not only affected slaves, uh, black people in the South uh, that were enslaved, but also blacks in the North that had either escaped or were born free, but still could be kidnapped and had a hard time uh, proving their proving their uh, freedom, which was obviously put in the most recent uh, the recent film Twelve Years a Slave. Then after after the Civil War, you have Reconstruction. The South fights back against that. But uh, eventually it goes away with the Republican compromise that brought in Rutherford B. Hayes and you had basically all of the rights that had been given to blacks through the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments basically completely stripped away. Blacks in government were, were removed, some through democratic means, some through basically coups d'etat. Uh, you had – black people couldn't sit on juries. They couldn't testify against white people. Um, you had state-sponsored terrorism where uh, essentially uh, – Police officers were often the people who were leading in the Klan uh, when it, they would like meet out their own type of justice, whether or not they used to use the courts or not, which were generally, uh, you know, stacked against them anyway. Uh, then, of course, you also have the beginning of police brutality, which you know, of course, lives through this day. Allowing lynchings to happen, another one. Well, yeah, allowing, allowing lynching to happen, or or, or or you know, leading the lynch parties often. I mean, you. When you read a lot about the lynchings, you're like, oh, the investigation never happened. Well, a lot of the reason why the investigation never happened is because they were there. <laughs> they knew what was going on. Oh, I'll leave the keys right here, gentlemen, and I'll step out. Yeah, it, exactly. exactly. Um, and then you also had less reported stuff like the convict lease program where you had uh, – of course, the, the southern economy was depressed after the war uh, and uh, so a lot of people went to work for sharecropping and, and you know, they would get – you know, they would hopefully get as much as they they had earned, but a lot of times they were basically just basically living on a subsistence level. Well, if they during the same time they passed a lot of like vagrancy laws, and while on the books it looks like a colorblind law, what what it essentially happened was is like oh if you're black and without a job they're going to throw you in jail. Then make you work. Yeah, and, and they would it would make you work, and they would basically sell you back into corporate slavery, where you had people in the South that were arrested for vagrancy, and then they couldn't. Uh, pay their, you know, pay their fine to get out, and they're like, "Well, now you're going to do a year, and then now you're in, in prison." They're like, "Oh, well, we need labor in the north, so hey, how about you go work in this mine?" And then these, these untold stories of hundreds of people who were assumed to be criminals because they they went into the criminal justice system, but then eventually were just, you know, were essentially, you know, just jobless in the south, and there was not a whole lot they could and do. And this, this targeted chiefly blacks, or was it that, or did it? Target say poor whites and jobless whites as well. It, it was it was chiefly used against blacks. I think most of the time when you if you had a like white person picked up for vagrant vagrancy, it was going to be something like you know public drunkenness, and they'd be like basically let out. Oh yeah, you know, the, like, the uh, big weapon for sheriffs and anyone in state positions was just discretionary enforcement sure. of, of all, all these things. These laws were not really meant to be applied to white people and we never applied them to white people. Uh, they're just applied to black people. Yeah, very bad. And then of course they got codified more with Jim Crow laws which, which were then put in place uh, with the Plessy v. Ferguson case too and, and then it got even worse and worse and worse. Yeah, absolutely. And it just became this point where you have black people that were shut out of like labor markets, shut out of 
you know, you can't, you know, you can't eat at the lunch counters. You can't go into the front of the stores. I mean, it, it, this long, it all state supported racism. Um, then you have like just weird things that happen, like like federal recognition of segregation. You you had it in the South, and it was basically when when Hayes came in and Reconstruction ended. I think it's fair to say that the Republican Party and the federal government just kind of turned their back to the South and let the South do what they wanted to do. Absolutely. But as the 20th century came in, you actually started to have federal recognition of, of, of segregation. For example, there are twice as many bathrooms as are needed in the Pentagon because they built it in Jim Crow, Virginia and they couldn't have the same bathroom. So of course, we're, the government is spending millions of dollars unnecessarily because they recognized Virginia state law, which is absolutely against the constitution. Uh, it, even earlier, you have uh, black troops returning home from – who fought in World War II who had to like get in the back of the train while German POWs ran – like were able to sit up front in, you know, in basic luxury cars. Well, it wasn't even the, the integrating of the military that, that Truman did too in that. Exactly. Uh, so the military itself worked on segregated levels up until 1948, I believe was the year. Yeah. And so then of course you have the civil rights era and things get a lot better. Uh, you know, the segregation is struck down, Jim Crow dies. And we expect, you would hope, looking back, that everything, you know, everything's jolly. But of course, that's not what happened. Um, you have the in the seventies, you have Nixon's persecution of the drug war. Now, keep in mind, when he started it up, it was like supposed to be, you know, equal enforcement and and treatment. Although he sold it as a tough on crime thing, um, that of course exploded under Reagan, and we have these massive uh, incarceration problems. Uh, you know the inner cities became war zones because of the crack epidemic, and you know again this is all basically state driven uh, through the prohibition. Oddly S enough, the sentencing disparity too. Well, yeah, sentencing disparities. Although, funny thing about that is, is you had, you know, part of that was actually supposed was supported by the Congressional Black Caucus. You know, they they saw crack as a black problem and so they're like, well, we want to show that we're helping, you know, our black communities that are devastated by this. Uh, and so we're going to support this 101. What did, what did these sentencing disparities look like? Uh, the the uh, crack to powder disparity was basically you would get five years uh, in prison for uh, – Five grams of crack cocaine that you would get for five hundred grams of powder cocaine, but because powder cocaine is more expensive and typically more associated with white people, um, then and then crack would get was this demon drug that was destroying the cities and you know the the crack babies and everything that was going on, which turned out later to be mostly made up. I mean, it was you know it was paranoia. I mean, there there were obviously the health case problems. With drug scares. Well, yeah. I mean, it's 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 always been that way with drug scares. You know, like Reefer Madness back in the '30s, and it's a hilarious and terrible movie at the same time. Um, but so yeah, it was. It's a lot of times when this these sort of racially disparate impacts happen. Not to necessarily use the legal term, but. That it's sometimes made from good intentions. I mean, again, there's no reason to think that the Congressional Black Caucus really wanted to lock up, you know, six hundred thousand, you know, African Americans on nonviolent drug charges. But, you know, here we are. Uh, you also have other things like uh, the birth of SWAT. If you read Radley Balco's book Rise of the uh, Warrior Cop, a lot of this is tied to Daryl Gates and the LAPD and his fight against. Uh, the, the Black Panthers, yeah, the Black Panthers, and <laughs> yeah. also the riots at the yeah the, 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 the riots of the time, um, and uh, which is funny. It, it, one other thing about the Black Panthers, obviously, I'm not supporting the organization, but they had a, they did have a lot of like community based you know uh, aid programs, and they one of the things they want to do is create their own patrols because they didn't trust the police because again of the brutality issues and corruption and and that sort of thing, but. Uh, what you would consider to be completely opposite now, you had a Republican governor in Ronald Reagan you know, pushing for gun control because we can't have these militant black people exercising their Second Amendment rights on our streets. And you get into 80s and 90s, uh, you know, you've got the Rodney King beating which again triggers when the nonviolent – the not guilty verdict triggered you know, the riots and uh, it, it just – the, the frustration with the state has it has always been there, uh, and 
now we have mass incarceration on a level that hasn't been seen with an entirely – which creates disenfranchisement and almost a generation of, of African-American males who are serving time in jail, which means that they have – for usually nonviolent offenses, which means that they have less employment prospects going forward. It all just kind of adds up and it's been adding up for – yeah, hundreds yeah. of years. Yeah, hundreds of years. And but the, the, with the sentence, with the sentencing disparity, a lot of these people are coming out now, and there have been some studies showing that uh, because so much of America is still uh, geographically segregated, that a lot of these people are um, are, are going to uh, come back to these same neighborhoods that you know that are already economically depressed. They are, blacks already have a higher unemployment rate than the general population, and certainly whites. And if you have a large number, like hundreds, like six thousand people a week, I think, come out of incarceration into these neighborhoods that are already economically depressed, they have lower job prospects. What what are we going to do about all of yeah, this? Yeah, that's a good point. I think a lot of people don't appreciate just how bad the criminal justice system is in the way it treats Black Americans. So we've talked a little bit about you know sentencing disparities and whatnot. But what are some of the other ways that the criminal justice system is? Is harmful or stacked against? Well, I mean, just like your day to day contact with with black people, you're you're going to see like a New York City stop and frisk program that uh, Bill De Blasio has uh, finally started to address. Uh, these, there was a federal injunction saying they needed to ha start having monitors and, and all that because over the course of uh, you know they stopped four million people over the course of like ten years. So what is what is stop and frisk? Oh, st stop and frisk is uh, basically a a program that was billed as an anti-gun measure. Basically, uh, there's a case called Terry v. Ohio, in which uh, a cop stopped uh, some people who were who were kind of lingering around a convenience store, I believe, and he looked looked like they were casing the joint. So he went up to them and searched them for weapons, found weapons that they had been planning to rob this place, and the Supreme Court said that's okay because he was he's an experienced police officer. They looked like they were about to commit a crime and for his own safety, he checked for weapons. So stop and frisk is a much broader program to stop um, the carrying of weapons and therefore a crime prevention method in New York City and other places that basically gives carte blanche to the police to just – if as long as they have an articulable suspicion that a crime is about to be committed, they can pat someone down uh, for – uh, for weapons, the problem is is over the ten years that they were, were doing this program, that uh, there were about four million stops, over eighty percent of which, sometimes eighty nine percent in any given year, were totally innocent. No, no guns, no drugs, no past citations, no outstanding warrants. I think it was higher than eighty percent, was it? I mean, it was it, incredibly yeah. It, low. It, it, well, I mean, you're as far a lot of these people had. You know, they could get civil citations for carrying marijuana, True. or they could, um, you know, they had a past warrant, or they had something, some outstanding, like they, you know, they owe child support or something like that. So you break it down by year; it starts off around eighty-two percent, then gets up to but the guns, the guns was pretty low. Oh, the the guns were absolutely ridiculous. So you have this this anti-gun program. Out of four million stops, they found about eight thousand guns. Eight thousand guns is a lot of guns, but it's two tenths of one percent of the amount of stops that they were doing. So, with this, you say they need the articulable suspicion. Does this mean that they were coming up with suspicion to articulate after the fact in many cases that that they probably didn't have anything at all, or or were these people? I mean, is there a sense that these people were legitimately acting, say, suspicious, and it just turned out that? Well, well, generally, with the criminal justice system, people are going to believe cops over your average citizen, no matter what color they are. But particularly, given the history and like the stereotypes against black people, you're going to have that. A lot of these part of when the injunction was written, there were a lot of uh, insufficient documentation that they couldn't really put a reason why they did it. And at one in one year, they stopped more young black males in New York City than live in New York City. So you're stopping more – you're stopping people multiple times and they, they've shown that they've basically camping outside of neighborhoods and just you know, searching guys six, seven times. And these are like students that are going to school uh, and so no, I, a lot of times I think they were either making it up or they're just like, well, he was, he, he was nervous around a police officer. Oh, I wonder why. But that's, that's a good enough reason for well, them. And it seems – I mean the problem 
beyond the fact that you only find 8,000 guns out of 4 million stops, which I mean if nothing else seems like a colossal waste of police resources. Um, but it's also – I mean the, the environment this must create if you're – if you're a kid who's you know going about your daily business but getting stopped several times a day and not just the cops aren't just talking to you but they're actually I mean they're putting you up against a wall and patting you down I mean this has got to be pretty psychologically destructive well absolutely even in the Terry decision there's a footnote uh, in which the uh, the judge cited the justice cited a, a, a law enforcement critique that's saying in minority communities stop and frisk not based on articulable uh, articulable suspicion creates a lot of resentment and you can understand why. And so if young blacks have so much contact with poli with police, if they're just kind of hanging out being kids, you know, it's like, what are you doing here? Things that a lot of other people don't have to do. Yeah, white kids get hit with it too, but it is so much it, it it's so much more prevalent, so much more hostile, and it creates a resentment and like a society that just doesn't want you. And I think that that's a good that's a point in general because you start to get these neighborhoods that feel like the police are an occupying force I mean, and, and this basic disconnection between the government and you, uh, that, that they come in and they're not us, they're, they're them, the white government who comes in and treats us very poorly, which is a, a general, I think, trend in a lot of the ways that African Americans have dealt with the state. I mean, they're treating them like they're occupying Fallujah or something. You know, it's a checkpoint. We are, we're going to check you out here. It's, it doesn't help for community policing. It doesn't help to solve crimes. Have anyone actually come forward and say, "Hey, I'll help you out because the police are, are friends." It, it really destroys that tie between the people and the state in a way that I think, again, going back to the general topic. Uh, African Americans feel that and have felt that for a long time that the state is them; it's not us. Yeah, and I think, and it also like general society. I mean, it, it just—I don't think they're thinking, "Oh, it's this police department that's doing it." It's like you see so many people around you going away to prison, coming back, not being able to get a job, getting fo you're getting followed in the mall by cops or security. You get shaken down when you're just like trying to go to a movie in your own hometown. I mean, how? It's so alienating and it's just really difficult to see when people are like, well, you know, why were those kids doing that in the first place? Why are the cops like just harassing people? And and so I, I think it really reduces the buy-in to the American dream that we all kind of want uh, and, and kind of aspire to when you just have agents of the state, you know, making lives miserable for basically no reason. Let's go back and talk about some some other things that have created that distance. Uh, I think that a lot of people don't know about um, in terms of policies that had extreme racial or racist origins to them, or were enforced racial in a racially disparate way. Uh, one of them, a big one, is gun control, which uh, more and more people I think are realizing. There's a couple books that came out recently, uh, both talking about the importance of of guns for civil rights, uh, but especially KKK. Uh, gun control, gun confiscating organization, really, right? <laughs> yeah, essentially. I mean, one of the first things that uh, after the war, one of the first things the, the South did before, like, fully implemented Reconstruction, was try to disarm the, the newly freed blacks because a lot of these uh, ex-slaves had guns for hunting because they were allowed to do that uh, when because they, they could forage for their own food on their free on their days off, um, and. Part of the reason that we passed the 14th Amendment was in fact to present, present, protect the gun rights of, uh, of the freedmen. But throughout the, for, throughout the history uh, since then, you have – again, you, you're talking about the Klan would, would try to take the guns uh, from, from freedmen. The, uh, the governments would you know, try to strip blacks uh, of their rights. It, it was – Well, another good one is the uh, May issue. We're talking about discretion. The May issue license uh, permitting that they have, which is you have to oh, demonstrate yeah. to some government official that you need a gun permit. Uh, there's a case from 1941, a Florida case where they say, well, everyone knows this law was, a pa was passed to not apply to white people. The, the, the sheriff in his discretion just could deny black people having guns. But that never happens to white people. Right. I mean it, it doesn't – it does today. Uh, you basically have to be a celebrity and to get a, a, to a may, to get in a, a carry permit in, in New York. But in places like New York. But uh, 
take, for example, Martin Luther King. I mean, he was he didn't believe in political violence, but he was not against self defense or defense of his family, and he applied for one of these May issue permits, and he was denied. Um, and of course, that was racially based. The, the South is f famous for its you know love of guns. And you know, and I have obviously have no problem with that. But the problem is, is like when it is selectively enforced, that's going it's going to have an impact on uh, on the people who that is being enforced against. I think this is a broader problem that a lot of people don't appreciate. With when you have discretion baked into laws, um, so we say things like, "Well, this law looks like I mean, this law looks like it applies to everybody." But if there's any discretionary angle on it, then that discretion – I mean the discretion may be used legitimately in a lot of cases. But if there are prejudices that the person with the discretionary power holds or you know, there are racism or other forms of bigotry are in existence, then the um, discretion is going to start aligning with those things. And so a law that looks perfectly fine on its face – on the ground is going to have really pernicious effects and be used illegitimately. But the problem I think that a lot of us face when we're talking about things like the, the experience of poor blacks in this country is that we don't see it. Like right. we don't we don't see that effect and that the people that it's happening to are often not in a position to make their plight known. They well, they don't have they don't have access to and they don't even have an ability to get that discretion reviewed half well, the time. Yeah. Well, absolutely. And I mean this is the, basically the prob one of the major problems with the drug war. You, whites and blacks use drugs at, ref at roughly the same rate. Um, Dave Weigel I think wrote about this recently where he was, he was at a party with a lot of, you know, DC, you know, DC journalist, you know, writer types and, you know, there was marijuana there. And there is literally no fear uh, for them to openly use in in their homes in Northwest, with you know they they're, they're no one's, the cops are not coming to yeah. bust Northwest down the door. DC Northwest is what DC he means. Like yeah it's so. more uh, gentrified area now if you go to Anacostia where DC locals say I mean excuse me DC professionals say don't ever go there because that's where the I mean essentially because that's where black people are and that's where the violence uh, most of the city violence is well that's where the drug war is 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 fought. And for doing the same thing, uh, white professionals in D.C. you know can get you, will land you jail time in in Southeast, and of course that's where you're going to have your SWAT style raids, where you have you know police officers in full military gear, as you said, like they're in Fallujah, kicking down doors, holding you know semi-automatic weapons to people's heads, keeping them on the ground for with no expectation of violence. Go going in, it's just that's just how drug warrants are served now, and this has been able to grow because we have this, it, like the uh, the crime rate in the 1980s just got everyone so like worked out. Crime is a number one public policy problem. So what you had a lot of, you know, sort of white voters being scared that oh no, our crime rate is going is going up and we need to do something about it. We need to put resources and and effort at, into. Uh, more policing, more aggressive policing, and so they they provide the incentive for the government to ramp up all this, but they don't feel the feel the effects of it. What that looks like on the ground with the tanks, with the with the automatic weapons, it's beginning because it's exploding all over the country now because of the uh, the the Pentagon subsidizing the militarization of all these units. More people are starting to see it because also because of like cell phones and all this. Um, uh, Tim had a great uh, briefing yesterday where he was talking about uh, Tim Lynch. Yeah, Tim Lynch uh, about the expansion of cell phones and people can record what's going on. Where uh, and it is now uh, affecting white homes, and now people are starting to get upset about it because you have people who are absolutely a lot of times because these are wrong door raids, they get bad information. Uh, there are perfectly innocent. Their dogs are shot. Like uh, Mayor Che Calvo over in uh, Maryland uh, had his two dogs shot, and he was tied to a, his. Uh, was I think it was his? Was it? His, I think it was his wife and his mother-in-law. They were tied to a chair while their dogs bled to death on their floor and questioned about a DHL package that was sent to their house full of marijuana that they did not order. And uh, I, I think when you have people that are able to see what 
this enforcement looks like, you're going, to, you're now seeing more um, backlash against them. But more white people taking notice, possibly. Indeed. But some some other policies uh, that that have uh, hurt African Americans disproportionately. What, what's another good example? I think that definitely minimum wage uh, gets some attention on that level. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, is with the CBO recently put out a report about if we up the minimum wage to ten ten, you know, we have, you know, a lot of people would benefit. That we would pull up wages on a lo- a large scale, but that we would probably have a net job loss of five hundred thousand dollars. I mean, five hundred thousand people would have would lose their jobs and they would not be replaced. I'm not an economist, but I look at this and I'm thinking, okay. Where is this going to hit hardest? Because the unemployment rate is already higher among blacks and minorities. And if you have 500,000 job losses, who is that likely going to hit more? I, I don't have the evidence. I don't have the, the data to support that. But certainly in the past, um, when – like during the New Deal, when they, when they were raising minimum wages, it, it priced unskilled blacks out of, of jobs. And this was pushed by unions because unions used to be – uh, you know, exclusive to whites. Incredibly racist. Yes, yes. and while while they've certainly uh, amended for that, their policies still affect people the way that the way that uh, they were originally intended to. Well, the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act and and the first federal minimum wage, uh, there is good evidence that a lot of people, particularly in Ohio, uh, representatives Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, um, that was where the Great Migration was occurring of of blacks trying to get out of the south because it wasn't very nice down there and then they were coming up north and they were undercutting white people for, for jobs. And this often comes as – people say, oh, you're saying that black people are worth less in the labor market. Well, no. It's actually that uh, if someone is racist and you're trying to get them to hire you, uh, sometimes the only way you can do that is to actually give them a lower – uh, a, a lower cost for you, and, and it, it's bad that they're racist. But but you can have a job if you undercut someone else um, in that in the same work. So th- there is a lot of racism originally behind the minimum wage uh, and unions and Davis Bacon and all these things to control wages, which which really disproportionately hurt African Americans. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another area that's we often don't recognize how much it harms. Black Americans, especially because the rhetoric of it is that it's meant to help, um, especially poor people throughout the country who couldn't afford alternatives, is public schooling. Yes, absolutely. Um, my, if I can like go way anecdotal here, uh, I grew up uh, and I and I went to a uh, a magnet school, and you know it was intentionally racially uh, integrated. You know they had these advanced programs and all that. Uh, when I was in second grade, we moved uh, out just outside of the city district. We didn't realize, and I, I had to switch schools. And I went to the school that was uh, majority black, and the students had already came up to me and was like, "You're the smartest kid in the school." I don't necessarily know that I was, but I was probably the best educated. And there's like, and you're black, and I was like, "Uh, yeah," and I it. I didn't really mean anything to me at the time, but I look back on this. I was like, by f- I transferred in fourth grade. By th- by that point, these kids had already taken a position that the white kids were the smart kids, and if this is something that they're being taught at that young an age, I mean, they, I don't think they understood it at the time either. But they felt uh, it. They, so yeah, they felt it, and, and, and of course, you know, I was in the you know in the advanced classes all through all through school, and even though when I got to my majority black high school. The advanced class was mostly white, um, and that, now that's a problem. But but on, in a broader sense, you have these schools again because we talk about how segregated is, the neighborhoods still are. Schools, neighborhood schools, are vastly segregated, and j- the, I don't think there's a more uh, dramatic ex- explanation of this than right here in D.C. D.C. has the – I think the 51st out of 50 states and the district ranked public school system. And they spend the most money. <laughs> and they spend the most money, much on security and other things um, and administration. And in the outlying areas, in, in suburban Virginia and Maryland, you have I think three or four of the top public school districts in the country. You know, obviously, it's not a geographic issue. You know, and it's it's going to have a – you know, 
it, it has a racial – it has to have a racial component on it because these schools on the outside, mostly white. Schools in D.C., almost 100 percent black. And it's – if you don't – if you trap these kids in these schools as the public school systems do, you know, there, there's no way out. Uh, and we you, mean quite literally trap in the sense that I mean with the public school, it's where you live is what school you go to. And so if that school is bad, your only option is to up and move. And if you're poor, you don't have the options to move out to Fairfax County or some very wealthy county that has great schools. You just – you can't afford to do it. So you're stuck and the school system, the law doesn't allow you – yeah. Recourse. There, there are horror stories. There's this woman, I think it was, she was in Ohio, that was prosecuted for lying where she lived to get her kid into a better school district. I mean, it, it's absurd. The it's more, it's more, I, it's absurd, and it's something that you know you have to. I don't use this rhetoric. It's a human rights violation in some basic sense. Uh, you, the, the people on the left like to use that rhetoric more, but you're literally trapping people into school systems. That if their kids go to them, they're worse off than if they don't go to school at all because they might end up in a gang. And then when they try to get out of it, you're putting them in jail. I mean, that it's just unbelievable. It's a human rights violation on a big level. I think. And, and it, what, what irritated me more than anything um, was when uh, Obama was elected. When, when Obama came into office, one of his first uh, priorities. Now, keep in mind, he had said that. Uh, he was going to do not what it was good for like the party but it was going to be good for the people. And one of the first things his administration did was to limit the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program which uh, is uh, a local program in which you could get uh, tax uh, – was it tax credit or is it a voucher? It was a voucher I think. Yeah, that you could pull your kid out of the DC public school and t take it to a charter school or a private school, whatever, uh, wherever you wanted. Um, the funny thing about that was uh, it was effective. It wasn't – you know, these kids weren't like off – the kids who left weren't like off the charts better. But they were doing as well or better and for less money. And this was taking actually absolutely no money from the D.C. public schools. Uh, they, they moved to kill it um, probably on behest of the teachers unions. And the, one of the excuses they used was, well, it's not – you know, it's not available to enough children. Well, if you look at the history of the legislation that authorized the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship, the teachers union caved and said, well, yeah, but limit it to this amount of people. So here the D.C. teachers union says, uh, you know, only this amount of kids can go into it. And then years later when they're stripping it, it's like, well, it's not available to enough people. So we, get, we so have to – It's unfair. Yeah. yeah I mean it is yeah. absolutely just infuriating and um, there, there were protests and I think they had uh, – they, uh, they had it on life support for a while. I actually haven't checked and see where it is at this point. Well, then let's let's shift our focus a bit because, given I mean, <clears throat> the horror stories we've just described and these awful policies piled on top of awful policies, it it would seem that libertarianism as a both a political movement and an ideology would have a lot to offer to to blacks. Uh, yet we don't see a whole lot of black libertarians or black self-identified libertarians. Um, but what – I mean let's start by saying what are some of the policies that libertarians advocate um, that would that would address the problems that we've been talking about? Well, yeah. Well, for, certainly obviously ending the drug war is I think the, the biggest one. Um, I, I think it goes a little broader than that because you do have to start thinking about how the police treat treat the people they come into contact with as a general rule. So I think just broader criminal justice reform would help. Um, but again, and we were just touching on it, school choice, allowing kids to get out of uh, out of these terrible schools that are you know stunting their ability to become viable uh, participants in a global market economy, they have to have a better opportunity to, to move up. And libertarians have been leading the way on school choice for a very long time. Um, Economic freedoms? I think libertarians have a lot to offer in this regard um, on business regulation. There are so many just sort of old, protectionist, ridiculous organ rules that prevent people from starting businesses or even joining businesses. For example, uh, there are rules in which uh, moving companies in uh, certain states aren't – have to sign off on any new entrant into into the business. Well, why would they do that? So 
if a biz- if a, a, someone wants to start a moving company and say this, they have to go to this cartel and say, "Can we join your cartel?" Because customers would be deeply harmed if there were too many moving companies. <laughs> Indeed, um, and there's also restrictions like for haircutting. You know, uh, w- Madam C.J. Walker was a famous uh, black entrepreneur back in the early 20th century, and she sold hair and skin products because they. Black people a lot of times have different hair and skin needs than uh, than than, the, uh, than other people, but and so hairstylists, barber shops, and uh, other cosmetic stores are very popular in black communities. However, there are these regulations that prevent just anyone from going into business. Uh, there are some regulations about – because you have to be licensed to do some of these things and some of these licenses are unavailable to you if you have a past criminal convic- conviction. Or they're just super expensive too. Which well, means absolutely. That- yeah, so they're cost prohibitive and if you're just, you know, just starting off, you know, the, just the, the amount of red tape and the amount of money – that people face trying to go into business for themselves, which again is the American dream I think in many respects. It's like starting off for yourself, being your own boss. Libertarians want to strike all this stuff down and uh, I think that's something we can offer to particularly the black entrepreneurs. Then what what explains this Dearth. relative lack <laughs> of, of libertarianism among blacks? Well, I, I think part of it is that uh, we have some very unfortunate past associations. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, who kind of held on to the like the lost cause and holding on to like the revisionist Southern way of the Civil War uh, have all, kind of fell into our camp, and they they also tend to be anti federal government, and you know good for them. But they when they talk about you know welfare and they talk about um, you know, crime. It's often it was coded language. You know, I mean, basically, you look at like the Willie Horton ad uh, during uh, President H. W. Bush's uh, run. It you know it was it was race baiting. It was that was the ad that that accused Dukakis of letting this guy out of jail who later killed some people. Correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was it was basically an attack on the pardon power, which is another story altogether. But you know that you know the idea of the welfare queens and all this, and this is always associated with black people, even though more people on welfare are actually white. But it's like this sort of racial overtones that have fed white resentment politics for so long that is identified with libertarians fairly and unfairly. I think um, I think that's like a real big part of it. Um, and again, like your general association with the the right, you know, um, Reagan, you know, again. Led the war on drugs. He, I mean, he didn't start it. Nixon did, but you know the way he ramped it up and the way that it affected black communities during that time. You know, anything kind of vaguely assigned with the right is not going to be most popular with with black people. So I think, although it used to be the case that that all blacks were Republicans until about. FDR. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It was the party of Lincoln and, and now Republicans are supposed to be racist or they're often called racist. So any association we have with them is probably not helping us. Yeah, I, I think libertarians basically have a branding problem right now. And and I think there there's also sort of a misunderstanding in some of the policies that we that that we uh, pursue in the courts. But so how should we talk about this stuff more in a different way or what, what are we missing in communication wise? I, I think part of it is to sort of make make it clear that when we talk about we want to reform the welfare state, when we want to uh, you know re- in this criminal justice issue that we understand that there is a racial component to it and we actually say, hey, this is wrong um, and distance ourselves from those of the past who have you know, kind of been in the same boat that we are. Um, I think that that would be a first step in a, a program in, in uh, getting more people, people on board. It probably um, is not the best uh, – Strategy too to you know endlessly talk about any of the Fed or macroeconomic policy or focus on corporate tax rates. That's the thing. Libertarians have more to offer about a theory of freedom. Absolutely, uh, it's not just about tax rates and corporations and which are important issues. Are, of course, yeah. but, absolutely. But it, there's often the perception that we 
talk about those to the exclusion of other issues. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, in libertarian rhetoric, you, a lot of times we have fun with uh, you know how, how we have these mental exercises like how far do we believe this? Like you know the the famous quirk of libertarian you know summer seminars is like well what do you think about black tar heroin and vending machines? But you know one of the problems with this is. Uh, one of the one of these rhetorical flourishes is taxa taxation equals slavery, and it sort of delegitimizes, you know, what American slavery looked like, what damage it did, what legacies it has left behind that we still feel today, and you know that they want to increase the capital gains tax. No, that's not. It's not the same thing. So I think again, it, it goes back to a branding issue and just sort of understanding that. Freedom is more than free markets. Free markets are absolutely essential to, to freedom, but it is more than that. That there are that there are actors and there are problems within our society that still, unfortunately, have this racial component, and that those should be reckoned with and those must be dealt with. Uh, all, but there's a, this uh, reticence of some libertarians to even address race because they think it's playing identity politics. And I, I don't agree with that. I, I think that when you have a community that knows it's being treated differently because of its race, because of you know resentment, because of you know just where the neighborhood is, you know that recognizing that and saying this is wrong and this needs to change is important. But the, the idea that oh, when we talk about you know issues that actually affect black people, that's like engaging in identity politics. I, 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 it, it's weird to me. It's like saying well, if you're talking to farmers. And you know you want to talk about the farm bill? Well, we don't. Let's pretend they're not farmers. No, they have issues because they are farmers. For people who want to read more, follow up with you on these issues, is there somewhere they can find you online? Uh, absolutely. I have a irregularly updated blog at blank slate at blogspot.com, and you can follow me on Twitter at, at blank slate. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.